In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Let us situate ourselves now at a very solemn moment in the life of Jesus at the very end when the Lord is entrusting to the apostles some of his most precious legacy, the legacy that would be encapsulated entirely in the Last Supper, which we see in chapter 13 of St. John, where we get really encapsulated some of the richest teaching in that moment of intimacy with his apostles, those who have been with him and have followed him all that time. He said a crucial line there in the very beginning of chapter 13, when he said, now before, this is John, before the, fa- the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the, in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. And John goes on or proceeds to explain or to describe what that loving to the end really means. We know also that it's at that moment that the devil entered into the mind of Judas to betray him. It was a bitter moment. It was both tender but then bitter because clearly Judas would not love to the end. He wasn't ready to do that. He had loved for a while. He was good. And probably he was quite generous for quite a lot of time. But now his human instincts took over. He had lost his enthusiasm, lost his drive. And when the need for sacrifice began, he withered. Probably doubts of this unconditional love probably happened for the first time in the moment of the multiplication of loaves and uh, fish, also in St. John, chapter 6, as a kind of prelude to the bread of life discourse, when Jesus sees all these people and has compassion on them and multiplies the loaves and fish. And he, you know, they, they all eat to satisfaction. There's even loaves and stuff left over. And people are so amazed at this at this miracle, that they say, well, he's like, he's like Moses. He's like, the, he's like a new Moses. And Moses promised us that a new prophet like him would come, and that he would be our king. And so people started to say, well, maybe, maybe he's our king. He's going to be this kind of political king who's going to drive out the Romans. And they were literally ready to give him the crown right there. And they were ready to do anything because he had performed that incredible miracle. But at that moment, Jesus just slips away, goes to the mountain to pray. Nothing like that heroic military leader that they had imagined. That is what Judas didn't like. Judas thought, but this, he should have taken advantage of all this popularity. You know, his... You know, his uh, He was up in the polls. Could have taken advantage of that. That's when doubts entered his mind. 
my kingdom is really not of this world, our Lord said. Judas entertained doubts, probably inner murmurings and criticism. He wanted some kind of triumph. And yet now, at the Last Supper, Jesus loves them to the end. And what does it mean to love to the end? He begins to wash their feet. Their dirty, grimy, smelly feet. And then, of course, he institutes the Eucharist. And, uh, well, it's not there in St. John, but it's in the Bread of Life. Uh, and it's certainly there in all the synoptics. It's there in St. Paul that he instituted the Eucharist. But it all started with this washing the feet. Now, in the Jewish Passover, there was always a lamb that had to be eaten. It was sacrificed on the eve of the Passover, and it was done in, in, you know, in keeping with God's command uh, at the time of the exodus from Egypt, when God liberated them from the slavery of uh, Pharaoh. Now, there is no lamb, because basically Jesus is the Lamb of God. And he is the one who's going to be sacrificed. Now we are beginning to see signs of what it really means to love to the end. To love to the end. This is what St. John says. He loved them to the end. And as we do our prayer now, we want to ask the Lord here present, help me to understand what it means to love to the end and how I too must love to the end. Or you could say, unconditionally, no conditions. How can I love to the end? And, I mean, imagine, if you love to the end, you could maybe love until you die. You know, somebody who, could, who died for his friends, sacrifices life for others. He would, you would say that that person loved to the end. But Jesus goes even, even beyond death. It, when, it's, when it says he loved to the end, it refers to the reality of Christ's love that lasts not even just to his life, but lasts forever. But also, I mean, to the fact that, you know, that greater love than this has no one than he who, lies, who lays down his life for his friends. And St. Augustine put it much better. He said, well, not better, but he, he said it in this way. He says, it was not only thus far that he loved us, that is, laying his life down, who always and forever loves us. Far be it from us to imagine that he made death the end of his loving, who did not make death the end of his living. He went even beyond death. So, we must understand this command of love and what it really means to love to the end, what it means to have this unconditional love. Of course, the Lord shows it by the washing of the feet in that humble act of kneeling in front of the, each apostle, each one with his temperament, each one with his character. And we know how St. Peter reacted and said, no, no, you're not going to wash my feet. Kind of like saying, look, because I kind of know that if you wash my feet, it kind of means that I probably have to wash other people's feet too, uh, or something like that. Or is, it's a kind of false humility. False humility, no, 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 you're not going to wash my feet. No, 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 no. And Jesus said to him, if I don't wash your feet, you can have nothing to do with me. So Peter says, Okay, but then wash my feet and wash my head, wash everything, right? Do it, do it, do it. Right? And uh, there's a marvelous painting of this that I had the chance uh, last year to describe in, uh, in, it's in the Art Gallery of Ontario by Tintoretto, a uh, 16th century uh, painter who, uh, well, the, the Art Gallery of Ontario acquired this painting through crowdfunding and Everybody in Toronto contributed uh, one little corner of this painting to acquire it. Right? It's a, but it's a massive painting, and it shows uh, the whole scene of the Last Supper, and it shows precisely our Lord there beckoning to Peter, Peter who's kind of saying, no, 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 you're not going to wash my feet. But maybe it's at the moment where he says, okay, wash my head, wash my head too. Kind of unconditionally surrendering himself to Jesus. That's at least what that painting seems to show. 
I had that chance doing that for Salt and Light. It, and it, to be able to stand in front of that massive t painting was a, was a great privilege. So we can say to you, Lord, now, clean everything. Clean my feet. Clean my head, too. That is, clean my way of thinking. Help me to overcome my thoughts about myself. When I'm overly focused on my things, my issues, when I'm not really thinking about those who are truly in need, and I'm not really serving them, I'm just thinking about my things. Clean my head means clean my intentions, that my intentions be purified at home, at work, in dealing with others. That my love is not really just about ensuring the best for me. My thoughts must go to others. What they need, how I can serve them, how I can sacrifice. This is what our Lord is, is, is pointing us to when he talks about unconditional love or when he talks about loving to the end. See, love can't be just partial. It can't be, we can't just give a percentage of ourselves and think, well, look, I gave 40%. That's pretty good. I mean, that's, you know, that's pretty good. 40, 50, okay, 50%, I'll give 50. No, we have to give 100% when we love, when we exercise our heart. You know, think of romance, you know, you think, uh, or at the level of feeling, right? Uh, you know, that's good. But that's not the full way of loving. It has to include our will. It's not just our feeling. It has to involve our will. And maybe too often we justify our own lack of correspondence, that is to love others, because others have certain defects. And we think, well, this person has this defect, this limitation, and therefore I, I can't really love him, him or her, or I can't really love her all the way. No, no, our Lord said unconditional love. Unconditional. It happens in a family, it happens in a couple, it happens in among friends. We can't love them only when they have exactly the kind of virtues that I need. I, I, you know, this, you know, I don't like that. I don't like the fact that you're not that orderly or the fact that you have this little quirkiness, uh, so I won't love you. Like, you take that example that I'm sure you may have read about that Stephen Covey recounts. I think it was in his book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I, I don't remember where, but, but he talks about a, a man who came to see him and said, you know, well, I married my wife uh, X number of years ago, but now, you know, we just, uh, just uh, lost the feelings of love. You know, we used to love each other and we had great deep feelings and stuff, but now the, the love seems to have, the feeling of love seems to have vanished. You know? She doesn't really feel love for me anymore. I don't really feel love. You know, what do we do? Like, uh, what can we do now to, to get the feeling back? He says to him. It just seems to be gone. So Stephen Covey says, well, then love her. He said, no, well, the thing is, I don't have any feelings anymore. The feelings are gone. How can I love her if I don't have the feelings? He says, then love her. Oh, look, I, I, uh, look, I think you don't understand. Look, I, I just, that's the thing. The feeling isn't there. And, uh, you know, I, I can't love her because the feelings, is, they're just gone. They used to be there, but now they're gone. How do I love her when I can't love her? He says. He says, my friend, love is a verb. It's a verb. Love, the feeling, is the fruit of that verb to love. So love her. Like, serve her, sacrifice yourself, listen to her, empathize with her, appreciate her, affirm her. Are you willing to do that? That's the verb, with a V, big V, you know, verb. <laughs> right? and, and it's true, maybe we haven't quite distinguished enough between the will, like our capacity to love in our will, because I want to love, 
And the product, that is feeling, passion, fire, doesn't mean we have to become completely voluntaristic and say, I will love, I will love, you know, no matter what. You know. No, no, we love with our will, but the result of that effort and that energy will be that we will be fired up. That, it, that there will be some form of passion. And so, Stephen Covey basically was insisting on being proactive, not being passive, simply in love. Or reactive and waiting for things to turn out or, or things to find you. We have to have a deep sense of responsibility. Unconditional love is an act of, of responsibility in some senses. To, to put the little twigs into the fire so they, they keep burning. People sometimes use that expression, I fell in love. I fell in love. As though you, you fell into a kind of ravine, you know, and you, you fell in love, right? Maybe that's, I, I, can, I can certainly imagine that that happens. People fall in love, they love at first sight and uh, things like that, and it's like falling into a ravine. I'm sure, I'm sure that's true. But of course, if you can just fall in love like that, almost like, boom, by accident, then you must just as easily be able to fall out of love. Because if you think of it just that way, it'll be like a self-driving vehicle that, uh, that may or may not stay on the road. You know? I don't know about you, but uh, I mean, Teslas are nice, but I don't trust self-driving vehicles, right? I like to have my gas, uh, my pedal on the gas or my, my foot on the gas, you know, so, so I can get into that lane when, I, when the guy's going too slow and get in there. But if, it, if I wait for the Tesla, you're there, you know, when am I going to get in there? I don't know. Self-driving cars, I'm sure they're secure, but uh, sometimes we just have to speed up. No matter what the speed limit is. And we have to decide to love God unconditionally, unconditionally and to love others. Somewhere there we have to discover that in our prayer as an expression of gift of self. The Lord showed it by the way he washed the feet of the apostles, by the way he gave of himself in the Eucharist. Then he gave the command that you love one another as I have loved you. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. I heard of a couple in Valencia, Spain, that were dating back in 2001. They were dating and they, well, they were at that level. They kind of like fell in love and everything. And he, in the meantime, was working. He was on the road a lot. And I don't know what kind of work he was doing. But then suddenly, on the road, he had a car accident, swerved into the oncoming traffic. Bang. Major accident. I mean, they barely, barely survived. And he ended up a quadriplegic. And then, against everybody's advice, they nevertheless got married. They got married. And she said, I'm going to be your wife, not your caregiver or nurse. And she told him that, right? And, and that's how it turned out, in fact. Over the years, eh, she is, of course, having, she's had to take care of him, and she does so with the love of a spouse, and she, and, and she said that at our wedding day, when in the, the actual moment of the exchange of vows, when it, when it came to the question about whether you are willing to love one another in sickness and in health, we replied, we've already done that. <laughs> sickness and health, <laughs> that's done. And she remembers on their wedding day, I stepped on the... Javier's wheelchair, and we danced together there. It was something unforgettable. My friends tell us that they had never seen such beautiful dancing at a wedding. Now they have a teen daughter, and she skates alongside with him on the wheelchair, which he operates manually to keep his arms strong. He doesn't want to just go around, zzz, you know, with the mechanical thing. He wants his arms to be strong. He wants to be able to pick her up. He wants to use that exercise. Naturally, none of this went easily. But service and sacrifice just made it, made it beautiful. 
made it beautiful. Is the love in your life beautiful because of the wonderful things, the, the having fallen in love, or, or something deeper, or something longer lasting? You know, when Covey speaks about this fellow, he uses, he uses the word sacrifice. He says, love her, serve her, sacrifice. Sacrifice. If, if there's one crucial sign of love, is that we are ready to sacrifice. In any vocation, marriage vocation, celibate vocation, are you ready to sacrifice? Do you, in fact, sacrifice? And indeed, all religions have that element of sacrifice. As a, as a way, you could say, of showing our love for God, and of course, love for others. In the Mass, you know, we have the, the four-partite purpose of the Mass, or the four-part purpose of the Mass. I used to tell the high school students that, teaching them religion, what is the main, what are the four purposes of the Mass? They had to remember, and they always remembered it, the ATEP principle. A-T-E-P. ATEP. It's just the only way I could remember, get them to memorize it. A, adoration. We adore God in the Mass. Adoration. T, thanksgiving. We give thanks to God. That's what the Eucharist means. It means to thank God for His existence, of course, for having created us and having given us the opportunity to enrich us by being able to, we, show our love for us. Thanksgiving. Adoration, thanksgiving. E, expiation or atonement. We show expiation for our sins because we realize we haven't been always been generous. We haven't given ourselves totally. Expiate. And then, of course, P, petition. We ask so many things in the marriage. In, in the marriage, in the mass, we ask many things, and and uh, if if we have the ATEP principle in the mass, we can also live the ATEP principle in many ways in any any relationship that we have in those that we love. It happens with uh, difficulties in marriage. Uh, Unconditional love. Unconditional love. Try to see where this is truly present in your life. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful phrase, loving to the end, unconditioned. Where have I indeed put conditions? Is it possible that I have put conditions? Because if I have put conditions, and I only love those others around me when they are behaving properly, or when they are virtuous, or when they don't show their defects, then it's not unconditional. I read recently about a writer who is a best-selling author, whose, whose writings or whose books were on the New York Times bestseller list. Her, I don't know much about her or even her books for that matter, but she talks in her autobiography about studying at Harvard where she met her husband and she was married while she was doing her studies in sociology at Harvard. And uh, she was studying there and they got married and, well, she got pregnant while they were studying there at Harvard. Both of them were studying there. And, you know, well, it turned out when she did an ultrasound that she was expecting a boy with Down syndrome. Down syndrome. And she, when she first finds this out, she, is, she recounts that she is pressured on all sides by professors, by colleagues, by doctors, by nurses, even at times by her own husband to have an abortion. Because she was, she was going to have a Down syndrome child. And she said, I have no idea. She said, though I was pro-choice, in principle, she just could not bring herself to do it. She didn't have a well-articulated reason, but she just couldn't bring herself to do it. She says, I don't know. I mumbled to an aggressive obstetrician, 
who was telling her she should have the abortion. I guess I just can't reject him. That's the only reason she gave. She said, it was a miserable, inadequate, a miserably inadequate statement. My real feeling, the one I couldn't articulate yet, was that my entire life hinged on knowing that there were people who would continue to love me unconditionally, even if I were damaged, even if I were sick. Such love was the only thing that had sustained me during, my, during the tor turmoil, turmoil of the past months. If I eliminated my child because of his disability, if I put him out of my life, I would be violating the only thing that was keeping me alive. I'd be ripping the rug out from under my feet. We all, we all feel we need to be loved unconditionally. And that's why we turn to God, that we know, Lord, you will always love me unconditionally. No matter what. And she points to what makes us whole. And it also helps us understand the why of suffering. Why we might have worries or even anxieties. To love unconditionally. Somewhere this has to happen into our life. This has to enter. Love. Like if, if I put conditions on my love, that means that I, somewhere I have a very fragile understanding of love, something that won't really last. Whether it's a vocation to marriage, whether it's a vocation to apostolic celibacy, whatever my vocation is, if it's conditional, so let us see if we can love to the end. It's the example that our Blessed Mother gave us. She didn't shrink back from human suffering and hardship. She didn't shield her eyes when her son was stripped, beaten, crucified. She leaned into that suffering and stayed by his side until the end. She loved to the end. And uh, she provided strength with her presence. She also provided strength to St. John. But then, after the ascension, all the apostles came to her. She provided that strength because, well, they had cowered and they had lacked that fullness of love, but they found it in her. Let us turn to our Blessed Mother now and ask her to tenderize our heart, to make it capable of love, to make it capable or at least properly expressed in an ongoing spirit of ungrumbling, uncomplaining spirit of service with a certain cheerfulness, a certain upbeat optimism, and you could say the light of love will grow, will grow, will grow, will scintillate in our life and it will really make all suffering truly worthwhile. Our Blessed Mother will intercede for us. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you've communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you how to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.